Hi, everybody. I know I'm a little bit early, but I just want to make sure you can hear me. Um, please give me the thumbs up or something to let me know that my sound is working all right. Thank you. Thanks, Valerie and Catherine and everyone else who thumbed up. I can't see all your faces right now. I'm really excited to see how many of you are interested in looking at simple ways of adapting play um, for kids who are at home right now, especially our kids who have multiple challenges and the people who care for them. Okay, everyone, it is one o'clock on the dot and we're going to get started. I hope you have fastened your seat belts. This is going to be a fast and somewhat bumpy ride. Um, I tend to overstuff my presentations with way too many slides, so please bear with me. Uh, there is a uh, Google Doc titled Session 4.3. And on that, you will find my contact information, the objectives, and a number of resources. Um, those resources are for you to add to, I hope you will. And also I want to reassure you that in addition to the resources on that page, um, there are a number of resources on the slides with hyperlinks that will take you there. Hopefully everything I talk about, you will have some sort of link or way of, of uh, examining more. And the biggest uh, takeaway is the last resource that I left on my list, it's a bit.ly, and it says something along the line of want to have fun. And that will take you to a Google folder of uh, resources I have compiled. They're not mine. I have not authored them. Um, I have authored a few of them. But anyhow, they are resources I have found online. You'll find that some of them are a little dated, but unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot out there on um, adapting toys for um, kids with uh, disabilities and, and physical challenges. Uh, so a lot of the information is tried and true, but it is not current um, from the standpoint of it hasn't been written in the last couple of years. Um, I hope we can do something about that because I think especially in these times when uh, parents and caregivers are tasked with doing a lot more mm -hmm. of the, the play activities and the teaching activities, with resources or very few resources, especially um, when we think about the way that uh, classrooms for kids with multiple challenges are equipped with everything under the sun in many cases. And now kids are learning at home and there are positioning challenges, there are internet challenges and there are play challenges. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. If any of you um, attended the uh, session I did with Alyssa Warren, Warren earlier today, um, we talked about modeling what we do in order for people to learn. So you're going to hear me walk my way through connecting my screen because if I don't say it, I'm going to lose 
um, my, uh, my, my train of thought. And thank you for um, Valerie checking out the folder and thinking that those resources are good. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Thank goodness you can't see my laptop. And I'm going to go to full presentation. And I should be closed captioning automatically, but they take a little bit of time. So there we are. And I'm going to backtrack just a second. So I'm Judith Schoonover. I'm an occupational therapist. I am also an assistive technology practitioner, uh, formerly with Loudoun County Public Schools. I was one of the founding members of the AT team. And now I have moved to Holland, Michigan, and I am an independent consultant. I just want to um, give a shout out to some of my assistive technology colleagues in Loudoun County. Um, this collection of resources is a labor of love from a number of us from Loudoun County. Uh, we not only uh, were interested in providing toys and activities for educators, but we started a lending library um, of adapted toys and activities and adapted book kits because we felt like it was really very hard to expect any one educator to continually change and change and change the activities that they did. And so we started to um, create these kits that could be loaned out to educators. And then we started to do some workshops. And right now we don't have that luxury, but a lot of the information that you will see in this presentation is information that you could share with parents and volunteer groups and others to compile more individualistic um, kits uh, that would be dedicated to the kids um, in their homes. So uh, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for children, play is serious learning. Thank you so much, Mr. Rogers, you continue to influence me. The objectives today, I'm not going to read, but I want you to take a look at the little boy on the right. He is playing. He doesn't have a fancy costume. It didn't cost very much money. It was created from materials that were found from around the house. You can see that his NASA helmet is a milk container um, that we cut up, uh, we cut the neck of the bottle off and um, created kind of a face mask for him. His oxygen tanks are a couple of two liter bottles that have been strapped on and he's wearing a pair of cotton gloves as his spaceman gloves. So it doesn't take a lot other than imagination to create a play environment and to create play things from things that you can find around the house. Um, play is important, it matters. And notice the uh, play on words. Um, it shapes how a child learns about himself or herself, the environment and others. Um, and so, the matters has to do with one of the resources you'll find in your resource files. Um, there are a collection of play mats to use with Play-Doh or wiki sticks to create fine motor skills. Um, these can be downloaded, they're free. Um, there's many, many on-site on um, places where you can find these play mats. Um, I really found a sparkle box because they do their play, mate, uh, play mats with a theme in mind. And they also have different, um, uh, flashcards to tell you different things that you can do with your Play-Doh. Uh, you'll notice that it's the English um, spelling of mold it. That is not a typo. Um, but they're just different ideas um, to help people who may not be um, the, the typical playmates our children who are at home encounter, but are learning to play along with the children that they're caring for. So speaking of Play-Doh, um, getting right into some of the different play activities we're going to talk about. Um, children with sensory sensitivities may not be able to tolerate texture. The scent of the Play-Doh may be aversive. It could be a choking hazard. Um, manipulating Play-Doh can be a challenge. And ingredients in some of the commercial and homemade doughs may cause allergic reactions. So with this horrible warning in mind, um, we have some suggestions for Play-Doh recipes and Play-Doh strategies to let every child um, who would like to engage in Play-Doh to be able to do so. You'll notice that um, throughout this presentation, there are going to be some visuals in the corner, and those are um, uh, from the um, Dade County Public uh, 
let's see, I'm gonna say it wrong, but it's the Dade County Early Childhood Special Education Group. And they, they have a wonderful website and they also have um, uh, a, a, a site called Adaptation um, Stations. And those links are in your presentation. And these visuals are free. They can be downloaded and they can accompany almost any kind of play activity that uh, you might uh, want to develop for the children that you are consulting or coaching with. So what do you do when you have kids with sensitivity and um, other issues, but you still want them to engage in Play-Doh? You try a variety of doughs until you get it right. You use to tools, you can cover the Play-Doh for kids who don't wanna touch it. Um, you can avoid uh, Play-Doh that's scented. You can introduce gradually. You can have it in the baggie. You can incorporate language. And as someone who worked in early childhood for many years, I found when the kids made the Play-Doh themselves, they were more likely to get engaged with it. And some of that was strategic sabotage where I would drop things into the Play-Doh and they'd have to reach and retrieve them. Or I'd forget the spoon and they'd have to mix it with their hands. So a lot of sensory things at the same time. You'll find on this um, slide, there's going to be um, a link to the, um, one of the Pinterest sites that has really, really creative ideas to do with Play-Doh. Um, there's also um, a, a website of Play-Doh tips and a website of various Play-Doh recipes with all sorts of different ingredients. And that's the whole point of this presentation is with our kids being at home and being with caregivers oftentimes who maybe can't run out and buy Play-Doh, there's a lot of different doughs that be, can be created that are both edible or inedible, but with um, common household resources. So the power of play, it supports development of all these skills. And you all are educated, so I don't need to read you the slides or talk about it. You know this already, and that's why you're here. Think about a child's interest in play. Think about their strengths and their challenges, their physical, their physicality, their frustration level, some of the barriers they may encounter at home. Maybe there's not a lot of space. Maybe they have positioning challenges. Maybe they didn't go home with uh, their communication device and they don't have anything that's accessible to them at home right now. I think about the goals and think about the available resources and raw materials in the learning environment. And the learning environment is anywhere a child is because anywhere a child is, a child can learn. So some of the things that you might wanna consider when you're thinking about toys or activities, and those of you that are, um, well, I, I was gonna say those of you that are older and parented in the, in the 70s and the 80s or whatever, but it's any of us. Those of you that um, are, um, a little bit inventive are going to be um, thinking about the things that are already in the environment. Um, it's always a joke about kids unwrapping uh, Christmas presents and having the, the boxes and the paper be the most interesting part of it. This morning I was helping, I'm in Connecticut visiting my grandchildren right now, and uh, this morning I was helping my granddaughter get her breakfast. And of course the, the um, the bowls and the spoons and everything else are a lot more entertaining than some of the fancier toys that she's got in her, her play area. Um, and thinking out of the box, you know, the bowl can be a helmet, um, the spoon can be a drum um, hitter. Um, there's all sorts of ideas, but think about what the child likes to do and think about the multi-sensory appeal. Think about how they're going to access the play activity, where it will be used, opportunities for success. And for some of our kids, especially on the autism spectrum, they have a, different, they have a, a lot of trouble organizing their play or bringing it to conclusion or really knowing what to do, how to sequence the activity so it's successful. Um, Self-expression, adjustability, um, the, the child's interests safety and durability, and potential for interaction with others. So why adapt? It's because they need opportunities to learn cause and effect, to interact with others in the play setting, to develop language skills, to develop fine and gross motor skills. Um, I, I just want you to take a look at this. I, I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's a, um, an orange crate. And inside the orange crate are some ball, balls, and there are also some bowling things. 
and the bowling things are made out of two liter bottles. And all we did was put decorations on the outside of the two liter bottles. So the kids were interested in, um, in playing with the, the bowling balls or knocking them down. And this was from a preschool classroom and the thematic unit was space. So we made all our bowling pins into rockets and the kids threw the planets at the rockets to knock them down. So we want to talk a little bit about the environmental supports that some of our kids need um, to be successful, especially our kids with multiple challenges. We may need positioners, and positioners don't have to be the fancy seats that they might have in school, but they can be mats and wedges, boppies, beanbag chairs, pillows, booster seats, tea stools, footrests. When I was a, a, a beginning therapist, there was a book out called uh, Handling Your CP Child at Home by Nancy Finney. Um, and it was filled with different ways of building your own equipment out of cardboard, out of, out of wood. We made our own corner seats. We made our own trays. Um, Alyssa and I, in our earlier presentation on ergonomics, talked about the idea of those big boxes from Costco. They can make corner seats. They can make uh, trays that go across the lap. They can um, do a lot of things. They're very durable boxes, and they can be set up for success. And our kids need to be set up for success in order to access their play experiences. Um, stabilizers, things like Velcro, Rubbermaid, grip liners, suction cups, carpet squares, magnetic tape, um, cookie sheets or, or cafeteria trays where there are um, um, raised borders to give them an idea of what their play space is and how to um, maintain things in that play space and not have them rolling around. Um, confiners like hula hoops or box lids, planter bases, trays, inflatable boats or tents, um, buckets. Those are all things that can keep our toys within space for a child who um, has motor difficulties or again, someone who has um, difficulty organizing their play space. Attachers, links and snaps and Velcro, shoelaces and straps, binder clips, elastic. Um, are different examples of um, attachers, and I'll show you some pictures of how those can be used. Highlighters may be, and it's not highlighters like the ones that you get at Office Depot, they're things that highlight specific features of the toy so that students can, or children can pick out that highlight and know what to do with them. Um, those would be duct tape, uh, Velcro, wiki sticks, yarn, contrasting background materials or textures. Extenders to, um, make a handle longer or, um, or wider um, so that a, a student can grip a handle. Um, th those extenders could be as simple as model magic, um, no longer film canisters necessarily, but uh, um, prescription bottles as long as they don't look like toys, so we don't want to give kids more than one idea. Popsicle sticks, paint sticks, those kinds of things, and simplifiers limiting number of toys or pieces, um, contrasting uh, color surface and removing clutter so that kids can zero in on what exactly they are making. Um, in these pictures on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a PVC easel so that a book is displayed um, in a vertical position um, for better viewing. Um, you'll see a, um, a shoe box and this was just a, a dollar store shoe box, but in order to stabilize uh, the materials, um, there was a hole cut to put the pom-poms in, and then it was a little, um, like a little luncheon container that slipped into the hole. And then the sorting cups, um, which were also purchased at the dollar store, uh, were Velcroed onto the top of the lid so that everything was stabilized. And then the, the shoe box itself was Velcroed onto a carpet square that you could get at the dollar store. So everything was still. So the only action that was required was either that using the tongs or the child's fingers in order to have a successful color sort. Um, the little frog at the bottom is another dollar store find. Um, we got, the, we got everything in the, in the picture from the dollar store. The, the spiders were those spiders that you get on rings for Halloween and we cut the ring part off. And um, those are that's a strawberry huller. Um, it was a little snack container. We put googly eyes on it. And then we Velcroed all the spiders down so that the child could just organize and see the spiders one by one and, and pick them up and put them into the frog's mouth. 
So we want to set up kids for stability first, because if, if they're not stable, if they don't have that proximal stability, they're going to have difficulty oftentimes with reaching and shifting in order to engage with their play. Um, there are store-bought items and there are items that you can make. And some of the easy adaptations are a bucket chair out of one of the buckets from um, Home Depot or Lowe's, um, putting a Xerox box lid or any kind of Amazon or food, you know, those uh, uh, instant meal things that you get on um, line delivered to your house. Any of those nice sturdy boxes can be used with a chair to provide um, a, a footrest so the child is seated comfortably. They've got their, their feet on something that can help them push their bottoms back in their chair so they can sit up straight and, and use the, um, the toys um, in a more stable manner. Uh, stabilizing toys and activities, um, you can attach them to a surface. Cookie sheets are great. You can place magnets on the bottom of any toy and place it on a cookie sheet. Um, Anti-skid rug material like shelf liner at the dollar store. Um, I use that a lot. You can get, it's, it's like a little foot mat that you can buy for a, for a buck and it's um, maybe 18 by 12 or a little bit bigger and you can cut those up but you can Velcro anything to them and the, and the toy materials all stay within reach and range. You can screw suction cups onto the bottom of toys or attach toys to a wider base or use C-clamps and those are just commercially found C-clamps from um, Lowe's. Some of the dollar store um, activities that we've done is um, picked up the, the foam cubes and just added the Velcro and put them on the dollar store a carpeting mat, and then a child can have a successful experience towering blocks or playing dominoes. Making things stable, this is a Melissa and Doug activity. Um, it's the, the dress up princess, but what we did is uh, we took the dress up princess and we put magnets on the back of all her things, and we put her on a cookie sheet with her, all her clothes choices. We added some visuals so a child could indicate the color of the clothing they wanted to dress her in. And this is a commercial cardboard wedge, but you can make a, a easel out of a couple of pizza boxes just as easily to wedge it up and put it within view. Other activities that are stabilized are, here's a top and here's a top that's and set in a, a piece of plywood in this matter, but you can do the same thing with a sturdy box, cutting the box down to size until it is the right um, size to poke the bottom of the top into. Um, there's wonderful PVC adaptations that can be made very easily. Um, I do have this practical, versatile, cheap assistive technology supports um, PDF in my Google folder for you so you can um, take a look at that and get some ideas. Some of these ideas I've gotten from Paths to Literacy, like the little um, uh, dangly thing at the bottom of the slide on the right-hand side. Um, that can be done thematically too. So you could retell a story by having props from a story that, ha that hang. Um, the uh, spinner in the middle of the slide is a puzzle piece spinner. It's just been made with a um, PVC base and um, a T-bar, a couple of plastic plates from the dollar store, and then puzzle pieces that have been Velcro, just um, for an interest type of activity that they can spin around. The slide, uh, the picture in the middle of the slide with the Easter eggs, that's one of those plastic uh, pretzel containers or Cheeto containers that you can get when you buy the big containers at Costco. Um, it's been strung on a PVC frame and then you can change the um, materials on the inside so the, the toy frame remains the same but to keep interest up for a child so that they're not always looking at the same old thing and they get bored with it, um, you can just change it. So for Halloween you could get a bunch of Halloween stuff for Christmas or um, whatever holidays that you celebrate, you can get props from that or specific toys um, and they go into the little spinner and they spin around. And then at the top of the screen is another shot of the cookie sheet. It's been put on a PVC frame that tilts. So even a child who is lying on their back, you can tilt the frame towards them. They can still manipulate the toys and the, um, and the dress up materials. And then as you can see, there's, there's visuals 
that have been added to that the activity so a child can make some choices on what they want to do. So some other confiners that you can consider. Um, these um, puzzles, I had a child that um, loved to throw their puzzle pieces and they were not experiencing success ever getting them into the, the puzzle um, frame. And so what we did again, using our ever popular dollar store carpet square, we Velcroed the puzzle to the carpet square and then we used elastic and, and tacks um, to attach the puzzle pieces um, to the puzzle with a little bit of stretch so that the child could at least have an opportunity to pick them up and, and put them in, but not so much stretch or length that they would either be dangerous or that they would be able to toss um, or discard the puzzle pieces. And this worked out really well for just ending up having a child who actually got the puzzle pieces in instead of throwing them. Discovery bottles um, made out of soda bottles and um, and various materials inside um, are a lot of fun for exploration within boundaries where you can put uh, plastic parts um, from, the, um, from the dollar store or party favors or whatever. This particular one um, had pieces that were attracted um, to a magnetic wand so that the child could run the magnetic wand over the bottle and the things that were um, sensitive to the magnet would um, attach themselves. And it made a nice sound, it was a lot of fun. Um, the wider mouth bottles, I can't remember which bottled water that cost a dollar, um, have wider mouths so you can put bigger objects in these discovery bottles. And there are some discovery bottle ideas in your folder. Um, just so you all know, I don't have my chat pulled up. It, it distracts me so much. So if you are chatting, I do apologize and I will get to your chats in a, in a little bit. Um, toys with boundaries. Uh, we have store-bought toys that have boundaries like the, the one at the top. Um, you can see it's, it's a matchbox toy with its little runner. But the adaptation, and I think I learned this from Linda Burkhart, the one at the bottom on the right-hand side is a piece of um, inexpensive plastic like you would use um, for, for separating pages um, in a notebook or um, a plastic notebook cover. So it's a strip of plastic. And then there is a, um, a toy car and it has a straw hot glued to the bottom of the car. And then there's a shoelace that attaches, goes through the straw and attaches to the plastic. The plastic is secured on the ever popular dollar store carpet square so that the road, which is the plastic stays on the carpet square and the, um, the shoelace or the, the, the yarn um, is, what the, the, is the track for the car. So the, the car will not go off the road because it is attached um, via the straw, if that makes sense. So in other words, the car with the straw on the bottom runs up and down that yarn, but it, it creates a, a play that is kind of structured to teach that idea. Then the shoe box at the top is a variation of that where it's a, um, a copy paper um, lid and it's got two boundaries on the side. Um, and that's just uh, rolled up um, fake grass, I think from, um, I don't know where the fake grass came from, but it's rolled up on the side so that there's a road in the middle and the child has the successful um, experience of running the car up and down the road. So there are some art and music confiners or methods for pro providing boundaries. And here are a couple of pizza box easels. Um, to kind of contain, they, number one, they can view them easier. They've got a, a clip at the top to hold the paper still. Um, there's two different kinds. The, the pizza box at the far left is made with two pizza boxes, one where you cut off the lid and, the, and then the second pizza box is just opened on top of it, which creates that tripod. And the second one is a single pizza box where you score it to make a, a surface for your paint and your um, water and then you add a piece of cardboard on the back so you can um, adjust the angle of the, um, of the pizza box easel part. Um, another uh, confiner for painting is just a tray so that there's boundaries at the edge. And then musical instruments with confiners um, include musical instruments that have the, um, the part that plays the instrument attached right to the instrument itself. 
So when we're talking about enlargements, you can make items larger and so that they're easier to see, grasp, or handle. You can also highlight them with duct tape. Um, this is a device on the um, on the left side is a toy that is uh, provided or, or available through enabling devices. And the toy on the right side is one we adapted. We just made everything bigger. You can see that the, the levers are bigger um, and the, the way of, of moving the, um, the toy base itself is bigger so that a child can see and hold it and get it moved around. Toys that have been enlarged include um, making handles bigger. So if they have to wind or twist or do anything with the handle, um, you, can, um, you can just add a, a household item, um, a, a Easter egg, a half of an Easter egg, um, a tennis ball, any of those kinds of things, a wiffle ball, to make it easier to hold. Some of the art materials and instruments with enlargements are a, a basic tennis ball or some yarn or any of those kinds of things. Um, that, that's pretty self-explanatory. Some of the visual adaptations that you can make to, to make things easier to see. And this doesn't necessarily need to be for a child with low vision. It can just be for a child to, to add that visual interest for um, sustaining their interest and attracting their eye to the activity. Um, the uh, picture at the top is um, one of those little light up wristbands. You can even get them at the dollar store for runners at night and that just attracts the eye to the hand as the hand is holding something. Um, the toy at the bottom is a dollar store shoebox with um, battery operated lights inside. We have two different uh, websites um, at the bottom of the page, 50 ways to use a light box and also how to make a do-it-yourself light box. So again, those visual adaptations provide visual contrast. You can put dark colored toys on a light surface and vice versa. I've even seen toys displayed on um, vertical blinds so that the light is coming in from behind the, the blinds and they can focus in on the toy. You can provide extra sensory feedback by adding colors and sounds and textures. Um, you can attack, uh, attach a glow necklace or a glow stick to a toy. Um, flashlights, there's little things that you can get at Oriental Trader that um, that you can Velcro a tiny little flashlight to fingers. And you can also use those to kind of highlight where the child should be looking when you're talking about something. Some of the really easy ways of making and adapting puzzles are finding a picture of something that a child is attracted to and getting um, some craft sticks and uh, gluing them together and putting the picture on top and then just running some white glue um, to make kind of a gesso and um, then cutting the same picture apart with an X-Acto knife, and then they can assemble the puzzle. And some of the hints that you can use so they're successful at uh, attaching the puzzle and getting it in the right order, especially some of the more complex pictures, would be to put numbers, or you can put pennies, or you could put, um, if they're count, learning to count by five nickels. So you have some sort of cue at the bottom that teaches them the sequence of how it goes together. More puzzling ideas. Um, these are uh, Melissa and Doug puzzles. The one on the uh, left hand side is a commercially purchased one and it has a magnetic um, uh, wand in the form of that net. And when you run the net on the puzzle piece, there's a little tack on the top of the puzzle piece that pulls the, um, the puzzle piece out of the hole. Well, you can do the same thing with real tacks um, and a magnetic wand. Um, the caution would be to um, hot glue those tacks so they stay on. The puzzle on the right hand um, lower side is one with just a variety of handles on, uh, doorknob handles, large tacks, you can use PVC, um, you can use just about anything that the child is attracted, uh, attracted to and that's easier to hold to, um, to attach to a, a common puzzle and make it um, a little bit more successful for them. And again, the visuals in the middle of the slide are visuals that you can find on the Dade County Adaptation Station site. And that is referenced on the, I think it's the second to the last slide in this presentation. And I think I also posted it on the um, 4.3 document, the Google Docs that we're all sharing. Adapted switches, I hope some of you are planning on attending the Adapted Switch workshop that I think is the last 
uh, during the last um, session of the day. These are so easy to make. Um, I used to make them with uh, the, the extra jacks that came with um, uh, Big Macs and One Steps, but then I found that you can really make a, um, a single switch that has the battery interrupter on one side and the switch part on the other side um, from just a piece of stereo wire, some double-sided um, tape, a little piece of plastic tape, and um, a, a, a pie tin. And the one end, um, I don't know if you can see this, the, the little pig switch that you see down in, in, the, um, in the pig picture is really an old CD holder. And then um, the, the, the pie tin pieces are on the inside. And when they are pushed together, the, the wire is attached to them. When they're pushed together, that operates, that acts as a switch. But you do that on one end of the stereo wire, and on the other end, you make a simple battery interrupter. Um, there is a um, instruction page for making the switch that's in the Google folder, and I can't remember whether I have the um, the, the simpler one that's just the battery interrupter at one end and the um, the CD holder at the other. If I don't, let me know and I'll make sure that I get you the directions. But easy, easy, easy. They take about five, minute to, five minutes to make and how empowering for a parent to be able to make a, a battery interrupter um, and a switch for their child. And all they need is a, um, a toy to go along with it that is um, an, a toy with an on-off switch and a battery com a compartment. And then they've, they've adapted a, a toy. Um, they're commercially available, obviously. And as I said, they can be adapted with a switch. So I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Um, mouse adaptations. I um, sent you, or didn't send you, it's obviously on the page here, is Linda Burkhart's um, Mouse House. And then some other um, ideas for making the mouse easier to manipulate and use. Um, if the child is using a mouse, you can put a little bit of Velcro on the edge where they need to click or a little button. You can use a party store ring or even a soda bottle ring um, to put their finger in so they know where to click. There's um, some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful free online activities if children are using um, a mouse um, from Ian Bean. And it looks like I forgot to put the website in. So I apologize for that. I think I might have put it in on the 4.1 page, but if or 4.3 page, but if I didn't, I will make sure that it's get it, it gets in. Um, these switch activities are also um, can be used with an iPad or um, another tablet type of device, and they're free and they're wonderful. And you can set up timing and, and other things so that it makes it a lot more interactive rather than just something that's a passive activity for the student. So we want to give them something to talk about, making sure that we are providing visuals um, and um, some sort of way of communicating regardless of what they have available at home. There are free, active, uh, there are free um, apps that have basic communication, um, voice output, functions, and then there are um, paper-based things that can be printed from the internet. AAC and play, remembering um, all the different things that you can do with a few simple words. So this is an example that was developed by one of our speech pathologists in Loudoun County of all the different core words that can be used with um, block play or, or whatever. And sometimes, again, caregivers just need some suggestions on um, what to do, and then they can take it from there. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see that, again, we're using carpet squares, and we've attached some pieces from a puzzle, and then we've attached another game. Um, it was one of those little um, toddler toys where when you push the buttons, the, the animals make the different sounds, and then we've got the visuals that go along with them. So we've combined a bunch of different toys to make a new play experience. Playing with words, if, if you're working on vocabulary, finding everything in the world in the house that would um, exemplify the word go. And it might be storybooks the parents already have. It might be a red light, green light activity out of construction paper. Um, it could be anything that you wanna turn on or make happen. 
Um, and that's all collected into um, a little kit that, um, that works on that same core vocabulary, reinforcing it over and over and over again. Um, and that way the kids can generalize what that word means throughout their environment. Here are some just quick ideas for adapting board games. I think I'm already um, starting to run over um, because I've got a lot of slides left. So just keeping in mind, keeping board games simple, looking at the big idea, um, figuring out whether you can change the attributes of the board game um, so that they can still have successful um, board game experience, but not have such a complex board game. You can use mag magnets or Velcro to make sure board game pieces stay in their place. Um, you can add texture um, to the board game to make it a little bit more understandable and um, tactically responsive. So here's some different ways of adapting card games and card holders. Um, as you can see, the dice are contained in a bottle on the left-hand side picture so that they don't roll away or fall off the, um, the table. Uh, cards are displayed in a pool noodle that has a little slit cut in it. Um, on the right-hand side, cards are displayed in a hairbrush, or cards are displayed or fanned out in, um, that's two little margarine tub lids that have been attached with a brad, so the cards can be placed in between those two lids and you can hold them easier. At the bottom is, is um, a pool noodle variation with a slit in the pool noodle and the cards are placed inside, make them easier to hold and easier to see. And here's just adapting dice again. Um, for any kid that has had a paint spinner, um, you can um, add uh, an overlay to a paint spinner to turn it into a, a dice spinner game. Um, and you can add Velcro um, and make your dice bigger um, and uh, make the dots uh, more tactily responsive so that the kids find, have an easier time of counting the number on the dice. This is my passion, adapting books, and I won't have time to talk about all the different ways that you can adapt books, but um, if you want to email me, we could have lots of conversations. Um, I love to adapt books, and you can see that uh, um, on the right-hand side is actually a book that um, I, I printed in PowerPoint in uh, two slides per page so that they came out in a half a sheet, and I put the half sheets in order in the bottom of an old DVD holder. And then at the top, I put Velcro sensitive material and I put the props that went along with the storybook. So as they turn the pages of the storybooks, they could pull the props down and use them. Um, props are important for stories. And you can see on the picture, lower left-hand picture, there is um, an old um, Patty Devon King uh, book called No No Puppy. And there is a real puppy and there is a shower curtain ring attached to the puppy, so the puppy is easy to pick up. And the text is reading, um, no, no puppy, don't eat that, something along that line. And then there's all sorts of things that the puppy's not supposed to eat, but they're really the props so that the puppy does, isn't supposed to eat the sock or isn't supposed to eat the spoon, but can eat the bone to make it real and to make it fun and interactive. Here's um, book adaptations for access. You want to protect those pages. You can laminate them. You can cover them with clear contact paper, or you can put in Ziploc baggies or plastic page protectors. Um, the book at the top is a notebook turned inside out, and the pages flip so the child can see one page at a time. Um, again, uh, using popsicle sticks or little tiny clothespins or um, Paper clips to help turn the page makes it easier for the child to manipulate the page themselves rather than having to depend on the adult to do so. Um, there's some more adaptations for books. Um, there are commercial um, adaptations that you can find if you use the Don Johnson, some of the start to finish products. There are um, instructions on how to textualize those books, but you can use your imagination if you've got a story about. Um, Jump Frog Jump, for example, uh, here it is down here at the lower left hand corner. You can easily find things from the Beanie Baby box or the artificial plant box or from Michael's for um, little felt props and, and retell the story yourself using all those props. Um, there are a lot of books that can be made from experiences like um, the putting 
picture at the bottom of the of the slide that's called an experience book and if a child does something at home with you you can then um, retell that story or retell that event with props or um, uh, materials from that experience whether it's making pudding or taking a walk and finding leaves um, you can create talking books very easily with PowerPoint. I'm not going to go into detail about that. I've included this resource for creating talking books. Um, there's also Tar Heel Reader, and I think uh, the speaker who was talking about um, uh, stories earlier today talked a little bit about Tar Heel Reader, but Tar Heel Reader also has a new reader called Tar Heel Shared Reader, where you can um, use the same Tar Heel Reader books, but you can focus on uh, core vocabulary at the same time. So wow, uh, really, really, really great resources and they're free. You can either author the stories or you can enjoy the ones that have been authored. And the easiest tips I have for authoring any of the stories is just collect all the pictures you want to use in an electronic folder, collect the text in an electronic folder, and any of these commercial applications that you might use, you just upload them and put them together. And in PowerPoint, there's a, a feature called PowerPoint photo album, where if you have a bunch of pictures, you can um, pop them all in at the same time and then organize your pages and, and your dictation. This is my granddaughter, Lucy, and we created a, um, a storybook in Book Creator, which is free. You can, you can uh, sign up for it for free, and then I think you can publish maybe 30 books before you have to pay for it. And that is a multi-platform um, resource because you can use it on the computer, or you can use it with tablets, etc. Adapted art, there's all sorts of ways of adapting art. Um, and I've done a whole presentation. I think it still might be um, posted in the, on the Lesson Picks website on uh, art ad adaptations. So I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but you can certainly contact me for more information on how you can adapt art activities. The one thing I wanna point out is the um, National Gallery of Arts Kids Zone, which you have a website for. And you can actually create art um, on your computer or on a tablet for free. It's drag and drop types of activities. So um, assembling collages and things like that. Um, the art kit uh, presentation I referred to you, I referenced um, in the previous slide. These are some of the tools that we've made um, for the art kits. You can make a whole art kit for like seven bucks and you can access all sorts of different art materials using these, these different handles and ideas. Um, so these are just some of the examples and I think the milk jug holder directions are in your folder. And if you're interested in more um, information about these, just contact me. So these are some of the remarkable things you can do. Easiest thing to do and a parent would love to do it and a kid would love to do it is, is melt Peel the crayons, break them up, melt them um, in a muffin tin, and you've got all sorts of different size crayons that can be easier to hold. And as you can see, that has a shower curtain ring in it to grasp easier. And the, the crayon at the bottom is actually an old glue stick container, and you can put melted wax in that and then screw it up and down um, for a lot of extra fine motor activity at the same time as coloring activity. These are some cutting adaptations. Um, download the beams. It's free. You can download it on your tablet and then you can play music with the beams. And I'm going to dash through the rest of these slides so I can just at least look at the chat before they kick us out of the room. I'm sorry I went over. This is an adapted um, um, website for playing the piano. You just click on the link and you can play the piano on screen. Um, some tour, store book, um, store bought um, and um, some free adaptations for musical instruments. Um, this is a great magazine, Search Toys or Play for Ideas. Um, Hasbro has step-by-step -step directions for playing with some of their toys and activities. These are just examples of the step-by-step -step directions and the visuals they provide. Um, visit their website and see. They don't have the potato head one anymore, but they have other ones that are fantastic. Um, these are what their printable resources look like. Melissa and Doug has great ideas. Um, more ideas, here's the adaptation station. Um, and just for fun, if you've ever wanted to make a pool noodle robot, um, this is an adorable robot. It's how to do it. And um, you attach markers to it. And then when the robot runs, the markers wiggle and mark paper. So I'm gonna check the chat now 
and see if I can see what you're thinking and talking. And please, 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 yes, you're gonna have access to the slides. Um, who has questions for me? You can unmute yourself or you can, um, you can, um, Oh, the best way to contact me, um, it's right on the Google Sheet. It is the 4.3 Google Shared Sheet. I think I've got all my contact information there. Um, who else has questions or comments or ideas? I wish you would add your ideas to the toy activities. So I'm looking at this. Um, I'm glad that you think the folder has good resources. The Google Doc, if you look um, on the, um, the Google Sheet that says 4.3 under the Zoom link for this session, um, it's under resources and you'll find it. You have to keep scrolling through. Valerie, I'm glad you're passionate about adapting books. Contact me anytime, we'll talk. Um, thank you, Andrea. You're right, um, Board Maker Student Center app has dice color and number spinners. And I think Lesson Picks does as well. So definitely use those. Um, yeah, somebody did say lesson picks. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any questions? Am I doing any other webinars? Um, not today, but yes, I will be doing other webinars. Um, and I'm also very involved with ATIA. I'll be presenting a three hour um, make it and take it at ATIA um, in February and I'm doing something else, but I can't remember when and where. Just contact me. Etsy has a great foldable card game holder that you can get in different fabrics. Great. Where is the Google folder? Once again, um, if you look at the Google sheet that's under the Zoom link, it says, uh, I can't remember what it says, something uh, 4.3. It's a very long sheet. It has the abstract to this uh, workshop. It has the objectives. There's a sign in part but you'll find that there's a section for resources and it has all the resources that are not on the slide. It has links to those. And if you still can't find it, just email me and I will make sure that you've got it. Oh, Andrea, thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments? You can totally, I think you can unmute yourself, can't you? Can I unmute you? Yes, not. Anybody else? I hope you found this helpful. I hope you will share some ideas. I'm so sorry I talked fast. I would love to hear what you guys are doing and I didn't get a chance to do that with you. Thank you, Maria, for adding that. Nancy, thank you for sharing the information. Feel free to contact me. I was on our AT team for 15 years. It was the best time of my life. Thank you, I will do that. Oh, yay, you can unmute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments? I do apologize for going so fast, but yeah, you're right. It's easy to create. I, you know, I almost feel guilty when I do this presentation because it's sort of a well duh. But when I was practicing, I needed those well done moments to realize what I was already doing or what I could do differently. So um, again, if it was well duh for you, I hope it will just at least um, inspire you to do it one step better or five steps better or a hundred steps better. Valerie, I bet your brain does work that way. Anybody else, I'm surprised they haven't kicked us out. But if you have questions, again, I'm happy to answer them. I don't see anything else in the chat. Again, anybody who is interested in adapting books, please get in touch with me too, because I love to talk about that. Oh, awesome. Uh, Andrea, 
the toy drive and co-op toy adaptation workshop. Um, I do a make and take at ATIA and, and on Maker Day. And uh, I can give you some other ideas if you want them. Um, some really low tech things like um, uh, mag, uh, rulers with sticky dots on them. And then you put magnets on the back so kids can measure with one hand. Um, you stick the, the ruler on a cookie sheet and they can measure anything with one hand. Um, the milk jug holder is always a real popular one. Oh, good for you, Valerie, the do-it-yourself AT. Oh, let me know if you want some other ideas because we could talk. Uh, some of my other favorite ones are, um, well, that robot one is really a lot of fun. The, the robot, the wiggle robot that you can do. Um, you can make a um, universal cuff with a, a Velcro sensitive material and um, put a couple holes in it and that will hold a pencil for, for um, someone who can't grasp the pencil. Those PVC holders are great. You, you saw a couple pictures of them in the slides and those are easy to make. Plus, just making PVC um, um, holders for books and, um, and uh, tablets. And they're adjustable in a, a variety of different ways. Anybody else? Well, there's still 16 of you sitting there if you want to talk or you're disappearing because I'm happy to talk with you. Ah, I understand you do need to run. Yeah, you guys got to get into the next session. Have fun. You're welcome, Madeline. You're welcome, Tal. Bye, everybody. I'm going to end now.